Hey friends, I'm Steve, Senior Pastor of Reservoir Church. So glad to have you with us for our online worship. To those of you that are live with us here at uh, 11 o'clock Sunday Eastern time, we're so glad to share this space together. Uh, to those of you that are tuning in later, watching the recording, we're glad that you can be with us as well. Reservoir invites everyone without exception to discover the love of God, the joy of living and the gift of community. And it's our hope, even through our online worship and our online ministry, that you can taste and see a little bit more of all those in your life through your participation here in the Reservoir community. Um, for those of you that are newer with us, or maybe you've been tuning in online here and there, but you wouldn't consider yourself part of the community, uh, you are welcome as the occasional watcher. But if you'd like to be uh, more part of the community as well, uh, you'll see in the description, a connection, a digital connection card you can fill out. Uh, myself, my colleagues on staff at the church love to reach out to folks from uh, near us here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and quite far sometimes um, to uh, connect, to hear about your story and what interests you and how you might want to participate in the Reservoir community. Uh, thank you as well, those of you that give financially to this ministry, everything that we do, uh, whether it be online or throughout our community or locally in greater Boston, Massachusetts, is made possible through the generous giving of our friends and members. And we're so grateful for that as well. I believe there's a link to that information in the description as well. Um, for those of you that are live with us, if you could join Sarah, who popped in first, and say hello. Um, we love for people to experience some sense of connection, uh, regardless of where you are. So good to be with you, Sarah, from New Jersey. And uh, would love to. I've had the great privilege of being one of the many guests in Sarah's home in New Jersey. So, so great to be with you. I would love for others uh, to say hello, maybe share your name, and wherever it is that you're participating from today. I've got a couple announcements I'd like to mention as we get going in this service. One is that Reservoir uh, is in the midst of our celebration of Lent. Uh, Lent in Old English just means spring, but it's the English word for this six-week season that many followers of Jesus and Christians globally throughout the earth celebrate. The six weeks before Easter has often been set aside historically and still now as a time for a maybe more reflection and for spiritual formation to invite God as you understand God today to deepen and uh, form our lives. And there's a variety of practices that followers of Jesus, churchgoers have embraced uh, throughout the centuries to do that. At Reservoir, we specifically prepare a guide for the season. It's on our website at reservoirchurch.org. Our Lenten guide this year's season is Earth, and we are exploring uh, how it is that we can live in harmony and peace, humbly, uh, gratefully and openly with all of God's creation. So we invite you to visit reservoirchurch.org and check out that guide and participate. Um, I have another announcement that um, is about to pop up in the highlights that I'm forgetting. So I might circle back to that one. <laughs> but um, the, I do want to highlight that after today's service live, there's going to be a... Um, uh, Zoom Hangout. Um, so if you look in the description, there'll be a link there to a uh, Zoom link that you can, uh, it'll be a very quick registration and then, you know, just a, a name and email and then access the email. We uh, now and then, roughly once a month, uh, create a space uh, live over Zoom after this online service for uh, people that are worshiping online to be able to connect with one another. So love for you to be able to participate in that. Um, let me pray for us. I'm going to Turn over to a, a band who's going to lead us in, in song, and then I'm going to introduce our, our guest speaker for the gathering today. Our loving God, we, uh, wherever we are, in uh, New Jersey, in Nashville, Connecticut, Brighton, Massachusetts, Wayne, Pennsylvania, Waltham, and uh, right here down the street from where I am in, in Cambridge, and all the other spaces that we're participating from today, we know, God, you are without walls without boundary. You're God of this whole universe and God, creator spirit of this earth as well. We celebrate your presence unseen among us. And we ask God that you would give us what Jesus called eyes to see and ears to hear, imaginations, minds, hearts to perceive your seen visible presence throughout all of creation. That we could know we are never alone and be encouraged by the God who is always with us. That we could be strengthened and equipped to live in community and harmony with all your people and all your creation, and that we could more and more be empowered, uh, humble, 
uh, grateful, purposeful stewards of these lives that you've given us and of all of the creation that we touch and see as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, friends, let's sing together for a minute if you like.
All right, friends, it's my great privilege to introduce today's guest speaker. As Reservoir, um, over the past couple of years, has gotten more of a presence online, we have uh, realized that we can sometimes bring a friends of Reservoir from afar uh, to us um, in a way that we couldn't when we only did things in person. And today we're going to hear from a friend of Reservoir that is uh, living out on the West Coast in Oregon. His name's Randy Woodley. Um, Randy is recognized as a Cherokee descendant by the United Kituwa Band of Cherokee Indians. Randy and his wife Edith are the founders of Elohi Indigenous Center for Earth Justice and Elohi Farm and Seeds. Through Elohi, they invite people to a new relationship with creation and model sustainable farming practices and earth justice. Uh, Randy and his wife Edith are leaders uh, nationally in uh, preserving and transmitting uh, wisdom and practices of the indigenous peoples of this land. And Randy in particular, really over the last 30 years, has been a, a national and international leader in integrating a traditional indigenous wisdom uh, with the wisdom and faith of the way of Jesus. And uh, Randy's been an important voice in the shaping of this year's Lent. For those of you that are following along in the Reservoir's Lenten Guide, we'll see quotes from Randy on a number of occasions. Uh, Randy's kind of been a mentor of, of mine from afar through his books over the years. Randy has uh, published many books. He's recently retired as a tenured and distinguished professor at George Fox University. Um, Randy has uh, written, published his dissertation, which I'll mention in his uh, talk today on Shalom, which is a, a Bible, a Hebrew word, and in Arabic, salam, which means sort of just peace or wellness, and that biblical concept of shalom and how it integrates with what Randy's called the Harmony Way, a uh, practice of uh, wisdom and harmony seen in many of the indigenous peoples of this land. And uh, Randy's published since then books that are more sort of academic that have shaped me as a theologian. He's published on the Western worldview that has been transmitted through Christianity and other means through Europe, a bit of a colonizing worldview sometimes, and how the uh, descendants of uh, Western peoples, like uh, most of us that live now in the United States, can uh, decolonize and indigenize our faiths and our ways of thinking. Uh, Randy's also written like for popular work as well. He has in the past couple of years this amazing book out here around like a hundred ways of reconnecting with sacred creation, um, which is, is just ideas and practices about how to learn from our own indigenous answers wherever they are, as well as the indigenous caretakers of, of this land uh, that most of us are upon and what we know as the United States. Um, so anyway, I'm excited for uh, Randy's voice as he uh, speaks today on a uh, theme that is very relevant for our practice of Lenten on Shalom or the Harmony Way and seeing the Bible and our faith in our lives through indigenous eyes. Um, Randy's going to be referring to a, a scripture throughout this uh, talk, which he's allowed us to use. And so I'm going to read the scripture from Luke 4 uh, that Randy will be referring to, and then we'll uh, turn over to Randy for today's message. From Luke 4, beginning in verse 14, as Jesus begins his public ministry. The scriptures say, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, was praised by everyone. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised, and on the Sabbath he went to the synagogue, as he normally did, and stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release, release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed and to pro proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the synagogue assistant and sat down. Every eye in the synagogue was on him. He began to explain to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Everyone was raving about Jesus. So impressed were they by the gracious words flowing from his lips. They said, this is Joseph's son, isn't it? Then Jesus said to them, undoubtedly, you'll quote this saying to me, doctor, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we've heard you did in Capernaum. He said, I assure you that no prophets welcome in the prophet's hometown. And I can assure you that there were many widows in Israel during Elijah's time when it didn't rain for three and a half years. There was a great food shortage in the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to a widow in the city of Zarephath in the region of Sidon. There were also many persons with skin diseases in Israel during the time of the prophet Elisha. But none of them were cleansed. Instead, Naaman the Syrian was cleansed. And when they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was filled with anger. They rose up and ran him out of town. 
They led him to the crest of the hill on which their town had been built so they could throw him off the cliff. But he passed through the crowd and went on his way. Our friends, our guest here at Reservoir Online, uh, Randy Woodley. If you've been out to Ayla Hay, why don't you stand up real quick and let's just see. So, yeah, these people have helped us tremendously. So would everyone else give them a hand and say thank you? Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. So uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm a United Ketua Band Cherokee and then uh, my tribe is in Oklahoma. Um, and uh, between my wife and I, we, we have something called Elahe Indigenous Center for Earth Justice and Elahe Farm and Seeds. And what we try to do is basically demonstrate shalom, the big picture shalom. And we do it because we understand our native way, our indigenous way, is very similar to what was going on when you talk about shalom in the Bible. And so um, for many Christian people, they don't realize that, that uh, these values that we have are very similar. And so um, my doctoral dissertation was uh, about what's called the Native Harmony Way. And I used shalom as a sort of a foundational idea. And I found out during that time that there were so many things that were similar. And then that's when I wrote this book called Shalom and the Community of Creation and Indigenous Vision. <clears throat> which you all, some of you have been reading, and, and that's why I was asked today to speak about Shalom. So what I'm going to try and do is give you a non-Western walk through the Bible, if you will. And this is going to be very different for some people because it ends up meaning that Jesus looks very different. And if you could tell by the scripture that was being read, um, he looked very different to his hometown and his home synagogue because they tried to kill him at the end, right? Now, these are, these are not the Romans. These are not the, the uh, Pharisees. These are his hometown people trying to kill him. So he saw things very differently. And so I'm just going to try to help you see it through indigenous eyes for a little bit, for non-Western eyes. What does that mean, non-Western? The Western worldview is based on what we call dualism. So that we see the, the mind and the spirit and all that above the physical. So, so if you're a Christian, maybe you think about, you know, like, we're really a spirit, but we just kind of have a body. No. No, we're both spirit and body. In fact, scriptures never mention people without body, even on the other side, right? So, and, and when we talk about heaven, we ain't going to heaven. We're going to a new earth, right? That's embodied, um, and so, you know, all of these things we kind of look at through these Western eyes and we go, hmm, you know, we get captive to basically a, a, a what I call platonic dualism, which is to put more and privilege more on uh, the ethereal or the spiritual or the mind than we do the body or the earth and everything else. But we are whole people, whole people. We embody our theology. Now, the West... Western theologians, mostly from Europe, have not embodied their theology. Their, what they believe became more important than what they actually did. Opposite of what Jesus taught. Jesus, for example, he talked about uh, this farmer who had two sons. And, uh, and I'm a farmer with two sons, so I can relate to that story. And, uh, and he said, one son, he was talking to the Pharisees, and he said, one son, he told, go work in the field. And the, the, farm, and the son said, okay. And he didn't go. He didn't do anything about it. He had all the right stuff, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go work in the field. But the second son said, you know what? I'm tired of being a farmer, Dad. I don't want to go work in the field. I got things to do, people to see, places to go. But he ends up working in the field. And Jesus said to them, which one was righteous? It wasn't the one that had the right thoughts. Is the one that did the right thing. Right? So as we look back through a non-Western worldview, we're going to see, like, what you do is what matters, not what you say or what you say you believe. Because very rarely through history does people who say what they believe end up being what they actually do. So... Uh, the other thing, when we look at it from a non-Western worldview, we want to look at it and go, hmm, 
like, there's all these categories, you know, like, you know, theologies and, you know, all these things that, like, really, maybe, maybe it's much simpler than all this. So we're going to look at it that way. It's a simple way. And then maybe not so hierarchical. Maybe more about equality and equity and everybody having a voice. And so, so I'm going to try and take you through this first. So let's look at, and we're going to get to the scripture, right? Um, uh, we're going to end up there and then just go a little bit past there. But let's start in Genesis 1. Everybody knows the story, right? In the beginning. So in the beginning, God creates the heaven and the earth. And then it's like all these things happen. But they're all in balance. They're all in harmony. It's like you got the sun and you got the moon. You got the water. You got the grass. You got the good earth. You got the animals and you got the fish. And, and everything is in this perfect sort of harmony world, right? And that's the story of the good earth that God made. And when we talk about when God looks down on it and it says it's really good in Hebrew, those are the words. But God says, don't eat out of a seventh of your land. You know who it's for? It's for widows. It's for orphans. It's for immigrants. People who don't have any rights in that. People who are the most disenfranchised. People who are the most marginalized. And throughout Israel's history, that's known as widows, orphans, and immigrants. Sometimes it says foreigners or strangers. Because those are the people who have no rights. No inheritance rights. No land. They can't buy it. They can't sell it. And so God says, take care of them. But you know who else it's for? It's for the animals. The wild animals. Let your oxes, uh, the wild ass or the wild donkey. You know, it, it goes through these scriptures and it says that God is not just concerned about people. But God is also concerned about the whole community of creation. And so by structuring law that allows one-seventh of everybody's, and everybody's a farmer back then, there's no such thing as poor people. There's no such thing as people who don't have enough to eat. And then on top of that, he says things like, don't glean the edges of your field. Leave it for the same people. Let them go harvest the grain. Let them go harvest the grapes. If you forget a bunch of grapes out there, leave them. Somebody else can use them. If you forget a, a bushel of wheat out there, leave it because somebody else can use it. So in the laws, and that's why it's important to vote and these measures that we're talking about because that also is taking care of the community creation when we're looking out for other people, laws that look out for other people. These were all the safety nets that were going on in Israel at the time. So one-seventh of your land is set aside. And then uh, at the end of, the, uh, of six years of that, on the seventh year, your whole land is set aside for that. Everything. Well, that's a bumper crop year for people who are disadvantaged. But people who, don't, who, who have all the land, guess what? They better make sure they stored up stuff because they're not supposed to be going out and harvesting anymore. So it's kind of this way like, of balance that the scripture has to balance those, those who are extremely wealthy and those who are extremely poor. Nobody gets too wealthy. Nobody gets too poor. And the way that that's done is at the end of seven cycles or uh, six cycles of that, on the 50th year, guess what? You lose your land. It all goes back to the original owners. If you are enslaved, you're set free. If you have debt, your debt is canceled. Cancel all your credit cards. Wouldn't that be great? This is structured in the law. Now, the prophets throughout, uh, after all these laws are set up, the, the prophets um, are calling people back to this. That's basically what the prophets do. Come back to justice and mercy. Come back to taking care of the widow and the orphan and the, and the immigrant. That's mostly the role of the prophets during this time. And they name the sins specifically, and they call people back to it, and they say things like, do justice, mercy, walk humbly with your God. All these things are spelling out the shalom uh, way of living, the shalom and jubilee way of living, until Jesus comes on the scene. And that scripture in Luke 4, it begins with, and he returned to Galilee in spirit and power. 
Why was he so empowered? Well, let's look at what happens before. Uh, we have um, Luke chapter 1, and, and that's when, um, you know, God has something to say about, like, male, female uh, relationships and importance. And the dude who's so important, Simon, um, he didn't believe what God said, so he said, you know, shut up. You can't speak no more. Your wife's going to talk. Okay, so, so we see that in the first one. The second chapter, Mary's song. All of a sudden, it's like focused on these two women, Mary and uh, Elizabeth. And Mary's, what is Mary's song about? Like, my son is going to create, or recreate, if you will, or bring back this whole Shalom Sabbath Jubilee construct. Because guess what? The rich are going to go away mad and unhappy, and the poor are going to celebrate and be happy. Because that's what happens in Shalom, Sabbath, Jubilee. And then Jesus goes out into the wilderness. You ever think about that? Like, okay, we focus, right? Western theology focuses on like three temptations by the devil. Three temptations. And that's all we think happened. So let's just say each one of those took a day. What did Jesus do for the other 37 days? He was communing with creation. He was watching his relatives, the flowers and the bees and the animals. And I believe that's where God spoke to him the most. And that's why he returns to Galilee in power. Because he'd been there. And you think, okay, well, wait a minute. That's stretching it. Really? Because Jesus was not like born in the quote unquote, there whatever it was one of the caveman days, okay? There were technologically advanced systems going on all around him. And Jesus is, you know, like this country guy, right? He's brought up in Nazareth. These are a bunch of country folk. But when he goes to um, Jerusalem, which is now sort of the center of everything, and uh, I mean, I mean, imagine he's like me. First time I got to Chicago, right? I come up out of the subway, I'm looking around, you know, I'm in my cowboy hat and cowboy boots and earrings, and I got my hair in braids and, and blue jeans, and I'm walking, and I'm looking, I'm like, where am I? You know, I feel like I landed on Mars, right? And there's a policeman over there, and I say, you know, excuse me, sir, I'm not from around here. He says, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the way Jesus is. He he's, comes into the Jerusalem for the first time, you know, it's like, what is all this? You know, I won't have this in my city, in my little village. Uh, he, he's not a complicated guy. And not a complex guy. And so, so Jesus, here he is, and, you know, he, there's this temple and things going on, and he goes back to his hometown, and he's in his synagogue, and he reads this r scroll from Isaiah 61, which talks about the day when all this happens, the day that this person comes to fulfill this for Israel. But he doesn't just fulfill it for Israel. He fulfills it for everybody, by the way. But, and, and here's this guy. And, you know, the hippies had it right in the 60s when they talk about Jesus being a flower child, right? I mean, what did he talk about? Not all these inventions and technologies. Not about, you know, aqueducts and crossbows and chariots and, you know, uh, not lighting at night and all these kinds of things that he didn't have in his place. He wasn't impressed by all that. What was he impressed by? Flowers, animals, birds, someone said birds, grain, the soil. These are the things that he knew. These are the things that he talked about. Why? Because that's part of creation. That's part of the community of creation. But so are people. We just focus on people. We forget that the rest is because of this dualism that we've been uploaded and Jesus, who does he say is important? Well, remember, he's bringing back this Shalom, Sabbath, Jubilee construct. He spends almost all his time with who? The most marginalized in society. The people who were outcasts. The people who no one else wanted. Because he understood his role as someone who is to fix, as a human being, to fix the community of creation. And he embodies that for us. In his mission, he says right there, this day this is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, right now, 
Me. I'm the one. So if you want to know what a human being is supposed to look like, you look at Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, you look at Jesus because Jesus does the things God likes. And it's all about bringing back this. So when he references Jubilee, and he also is seen, uh, he's called our Sabbath, our Sabbath, and he's also called our peace, our shalom. He is our shalom, Sabbath, jubilee embodiment. That's what he's about. And that's his mission, is to bring us to be more human, to bring us to the place where we are taking care of the whole community of creation. And like I said, it doesn't matter to me where you've done it or where you're doing it, as long as you're doing it. That's our role. It's people, it's animals, it's insects, it's the soil, it's the rivers, et cetera, et cetera. So he's trying to prove a point to them. And, uh, and they see things differently than him, right? And so in uh, a little bit farther there, it says something about like, they're, you know, they're beginning to doubt him. They don't believe him. And, and he's, he can't leave well enough alone. And so he says, you know what? Let's talk about widows. There was a lot of widows in Israel. But you know who God showed up for? He sent Elijah to this widow of Zarephath, this quote-unquote pagan, right? This person who was not, this, this country that is not seen as good in their eyes. And God reached out to her. He's trying to make a point. And how about immigrants, foreigners, strangers? There was this dude, Naaman, a Roman or a Syrian occupying force. Israel was being oppressed by them. And you know what? He sent Elisha to reach out to him and heal him of leprosy. And there was a lot of Israel, uh, lepers in Israel at the time. And they weren't very fond of what he had to say. In fact, they wanted to kill him. But I thought it was interesting that he uses the example of a woman, a, a widow, he uses the example of a foreigner. He's trying to tell them a lesson, right? Where's the orphan? Because these things are almost always seen together. Who's the orphan? It was the people in his hometown who tried to kill him. He was the living example of the orphan, being rejected by his own family and the people who loved him at one time. So, all right, Jesus is embodying this, then well, what's the rest of the New Testament about? Well, you got the Gospels that are there to tell you about how Jesus did this and how he embodied it and who he was and his teachings, which all line up with shalom, right? This way of living and, and taking care of the whole community of creation. That's our purpose. And most of the rest of the books, even though they're addressing specific problems, each one, including Romans and everything else, um, they're telling people, how do you live in Shalom? How do you live this way? How do you live this out? And so we can look to them and go, well, in that situation, here's how they did it. Now let's look at our situation, see if we can figure out something, get a clue from that. So, for example, and I always say the, the first step of Shalom is always hospitality. Always hospitality, which is kind of weird, you know, like we moved here from the south, and in the south, like everybody invites you in their home for dinner, right? That's like automatic, you know, oh, new people, oh, well, why don't y'all come on over for dinner, you know? And uh, we found something different up here. It was kind of weird. It was like, you know, people, they wouldn't come visit us in our home. We ask people to dinner, and, uh, and instead they say, well, let's just make coffee. And they wouldn't invite us to their home. We actually joined a church for a couple years. It was a friend's church, which is ironic, right? <clears throat> and uh, we just wanted to make friends. That was what we were about. And, uh, and, and we never once, only the pastor invited us to his home within two years of trying to, to be friends. And, uh, uh, you know, that was weird for us. But So hospitality is different. I guess it can be shown in a lot of different ways. You can show it by taking people out to coffee. You know, that's good. Yeah. But... Um, uh, then I heard somebody like say this. They 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 said, "Oh yeah, you know, 
In the Pacific Northwest, people will give you directions to anywhere except for their own home. <laughs> Hospitality is the first step of shalom. If you want to live that life, you got to accept the people who come in through your door. Um, we've been doing that for ever since before we were married because that's what our families did. That's what my parents did. That's what Edith's parents did. We always had people in our homes. We always had people who needed a place to stay. We always had people who were, uh, needed something to eat, and we fed them. Um, and, and, and we failed sometimes, too. But this is the first step of Shalom. And so how do you do that? You know, look at those scriptures, the rest of the New Testament, and you see, uh, example, 1 Peter 4.8. Love, right? Love encompasses this great, you know, shalom idea. That's a whole, that's part of it. Um, he says, um, you know, above everything else, love one another, right? Love, how do we show love? Through shalom. Um, and um, because love covers a multitude of sins. So, so like when you invite somebody in your home, he says, First Peter 4, 8 and following, like don't neglect to be hospitable. Don't neglect to be hospitable. Don't neglect the people. And when you invite someone in your home, don't complain about it. Right? Um, and, you know, everybody, it says, has gifts. We all received them from God. Use those gifts to serve one another. And that's sort of how we do it, right? That's what the rest of the New Testament is about. And if you want to jump all the way to the end and Revelation, and I can't explain a lot what the book of Revelation is. I know it's not really literal, but I, I'm still trying to figure out. Someone said it was a play. Someone said it was a vision. Someone said it was a dream. But whatever it is, it ends up with this, like, city. But it's a city built the way cities are supposed to be built because it's full of rivers and gardens and all of the community of creation loving together, right? And that's what the new earth looks like. And so what are we doing? Like, I love when I'm talking to young people, and I know there's a few here. Like, we need city planners. We need mayors. We need city council people. We need urban forestry people. We need people to change our cities, our urban centers, into gardens so that people can actually con connect um, with each other and with the rest of the community creation and can eat. So I'm going to say one more thing that's kind of good news, bad news. There's a, a study now of something called um, deep adaptation. If you want to read about it, it might be scary. Deep adaptation. And what it says is that like within a decade that we're going to have a global economic crisis and everything's going to fall apart. So I don't want my brothers and sisters in the urban centers starving. So we're learning how to grow food. We're learning how to grow the best of it. We're learning how to use the, the least water to stuff that will stay. But people in urban centers have to start growing food too, just in case. It won't hurt you. It'll help you, right? So um, I'm just going to leave that as, as one of the fulfillments of um, of how to uh, inhabit the Shalom Sabbath Jubilee construct. Think about doing some gardening uh, this coming spring. Um, again, it doesn't matter where you start. If you are fixing the community creation, if you are helping, if you are doing what God expects of you, then you're in the middle of it. And thank God for you. So, okay, that's it. Hi, friends. We're going to go to a time of communion in our service this morning. It's a way for us to pause each week and to remember the love of Jesus, to encounter the love of Jesus, and to embody it. And so I'm going to invite you this morning, if you have a little bit of food or a little bit of drink nearby, it might be a good time to go get that. In so many ways, as uh, Randy Woodley just spoke about this hospitality, this tiny little meal that we are 
um, taking together and partaking with, with one another in communion is really a representation of a, of a bigger meal, right? This way of having harmony, communion with God, a way that invites us to share with one another a meal, to connect, to do life and communion with one another. And Jesus, on the eve of his death, uh, sat at a table in communion with his closest friends. And he took the bread and he broke it and he passed it around and he said, uh, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Eat in remembrance of me. And then he also took the cup, uh, red as his blood, and he said, this is my blood shed for you, my self-giving love for you. And this is also a sign of a new covenant, a new way to be. And this is why we come to the table to remember that God is always with us, that we are not alone, that it runs through us at a vascular and cellular level. And so we take this little bit of something to eat, this little nourishment uh, to remember how abundant it is as we move about our lives and also how much we need it week to week, day to day to continue to truly live. And so I invite you now, as you are ready, to just hold a moment with Jesus. Think about what it is you need nourishment in, what it is that you need. Maybe you need help with something. Maybe you need freedom. Maybe forgiveness is on the table for yourself or for someone else. I'd just love to offer you a moment now uh, to think about those things, to come to the table with Jesus, to come to it slowly, to pause, to remember, to encounter, and to embody. Jesus, we're thankful that you are the one that offers us sustenance. You are our sustainer, our life giver. And so God, may it feel true in this moment beyond what we could describe into mystery. And also could it feel tangible as we move into our lives, as we embody this way of love. In your name, amen. As you're ready, you can take the bread of life uh, and the cup of liberation. Take and eat and know that it is good. All right, I'll pass it over for our last song.
All right, friends, that is our service for today. Thank you so much for being here. And let me send us out with a good word, a blessing for you today and into the fullness of your week. May you indeed find God's glory hidden and revealed in creation, all of creation, whether that is in a, a bird or a flower peeking through the earth this spring or the sun or a smile or an afternoon nap after daylight savings, wherever it is, may you encounter the goodness and the liveliness of God and God's love for you in all of creation today and as you make your way through the fullness of your day today. Thanks so much for being here and bless you. Uh, we'll be here again, same time next week. And as a reminder, if you're intending to hang out at Reservoir together, that hangout right after uh, this service ends, the link is in the description and you can join uh, that casual hangout for some fun time of connection. All right, have a great day, everyone. See you soon.